Hey guys, my name is Wellcard and welcome back to my channel. Thank you for subscribing and following my content. I really do appreciate it. Special thanks to my paid members from YouTube club, uh, Pete, Fatu and Coops. I really do appreciate it. Uh, last week I was talking about running out of coffee and uh, these guys really helped me out with this jar. So this one is for you guys and I really do appreciate it because uh, this is my favorite brand. Uh, so. You know why you're here. I know why you're here. It's Tuesday. It's news day. Let's have a look at what's been happening in the world of union. Let me just have a sip of your coffee. Mm. Oh, no sugar. Skim milk. Ah, so good. Anyway, so the rugby championship round five happened last week, which saw the 100th test match, test match between the All Blacks and the Springboks, a monumental occasion between the two nations. And since the Springboks won the 50th test, these, this one once again came down to the wire, but the All Blacks were able to return by claiming a two-point victory over the Springboks for the 100th test. Now going into this match, everybody wanted to know, everybody wanted to know which hacker What's the All Blacks gonna do? And boy, oh boy! It was the Kampa Opango, my friend. It's, it's, since it's been two over two years, I think, maybe just about two years, since the All Blacks last played the, the bitter rival, the Springboks, and they had to bring out the, the big guns, the Kampa Opango. And not only that, they did the Kampa Opango, uh, in their traditional triangle, I wouldn't say the traditional triangle, they started doing this triangle formation, which uh, which they been doing for for like a number of years now. They stopped that for the for this specific specific match, and they spread out like they normally do the haka, in the traditional way where they're all spread out. Oh, that looks so good! I was getting huge nostalgia here. Like they should stop doing that triangle formation. I'm not a big fan of it. I think I think it's too like showy for television. I think just being able to spread out and having some space for for the players to just feel themselves looks way better. It just feels more like more of a of a ritual instead of like a show. You know what I mean? The triangle feels like we're putting on a show for the for the TV. Whereas if you just ever just spread out and take in the space, it's more like more personal. It's more engaging. It feels more they are like they're actually issuing a challenge. And it's more, yeah, just a much better experience in my opinion. So let's get on with the game. So this game was very, very tight. This felt like a world-class test match. And South Africa came in with the high box kick strategy once again. Very underutilized backline. Overworked forwards once again. But not having that extra man in the, on the bench for the bomb squad may have hurt South Africa a little bit. Uh, this, they worked really, really hard in the second half, but... Yeah, I thought they were just kicking a bit too much with the box kicks, especially in some positions where they were just outside the 22. They could have gone for a drop goal or maybe forced a penalty. So the spring box was, in fact, leading all the way to about four minutes left. And then the All Blacks were able to get a penalty 40 minutes out for, yeah, three minutes left, actually. Jordi Barrett to convert the winning goal from 40 minutes out from right from the five-meter line uh, on the side. So it was a really difficult kick, but Jordi, the great Barrett, <laughs> Jordy the Great Barrett, slots this one with quite an ease. Pops the ball perfectly, quite a beautiful kick. Uh, not with ease, but like it, the, the ball just slided in the, the goal post and got this one in. Apollo's kicking has much improved, but his defense still had issues, especially in the first half. The Springboks tackling was missing, count was going through the roof in the first half, but tightened up in the second. Uh, the high ball was a bit of an issue for the All Blacks as Nkosi scored a try with following a George Bridge miscatch in the high ball. Will Jordan manage to score the first try in two minutes in the spring box basically as a result of Andre Pollard missed tackle. Oh well, one of the missed tackles was made by Andre Pollard, but it was basically like it, it, it's a bit of missed tackle. I think Diego missed tackle and then following Andre Pollard missed tackle. So New Zealand were able to make a break uh, and set, set up Jordan for a try. That is pretty much what happened this game. So following this game, uh, I actually go into this game. One of the All Blacks former flanker, Waka Nathan, died. So a lot of the players were in black bands. The coaches were in black bands. So a little bit about the 
uh, Waka Nathan. He was a Maori rugby player for the All Blacks in the 1960s. He played 14 test matches for the New Zealand All Blacks. And then later on, he became an All Blacks selector in the 1970s. So quite an influential person for the All Blacks team, especially, I'm guessing, in the 1960s for... For him, would have been a great, great, great achievement at the time. And then, so this match was, yeah, you ultimately sealed by Jordy Barris' boot, and the the All Blacks played a very tight game overall. I thought the kicking game around the field, the All Blacks were more clinical. They did fewer kicks, but they just did better kicks, much, much better kicks. Whereas the Springboks stuck to the same strategy, trying to overuse the high ball bomb to get territory, to get position, and not able to really get the outcome that they were looking for against the, you know, the New Zealand All Blacks who are very, very good at returning those high balls and very, very good at handling those high balls and very, very dangerous at exploiting chaos to their own advantage. So the Springboks was criticized. Let's have a look at this one first. Criticized for basically doing box kicks when there was an overlap. This was, you know, towards the end of the game was pretty much in autopilot mode. I had a video talking about this. This was probably the some of the worst plays I've ever seen. One of the box kicks from Faf to Clerk where the, the where, where it happened a little bit before this, just before, like two minutes before this on the 72nd minute, where Faf to Clerk did a box kick that was literally just outside the All Blacks 22. And you just can't believe that he kicked that away. Like, it's just really, really, really before. And, you know, you're not going to get an opportunity in that sort of position without getting points against the All Blacks. So that was really, really poor from, from the Springboks. So the coach defended their decision to doing all their kicks and saying that, uh, you know, he said he thought the game plan worked. Okay, uh... Yeah, they had. He said, we, uh, "We had opportunities, though they had opportunities. It came down to the wire, a, a call here, a bounce off the ball there. Something, it goes off for you. Sometimes it goes off for you. Sometimes it goes against you. And uh, yeah, I thought if that's what you think, it's just like you you really can't see the the big glaring issue in your team. You thought that was just." the error of the bounce of the ball, the extremely poor decision-making, the fact that you you have some of the best centers in the world. Like, I thought the the, the, the Springbok center combination is the best in the world to come your aunt and Damien Delende. Damien Delende has one of the highest line break rates in the world today, and you don't even use him. He, doesn't, he gets the ball like twice the entire game. Um, I don't know how you could think that's the strategy. And... Yeah, I genuinely don't know what's going on with this team, this coach here. And he said that, uh, this is the one that I really want to talk about. He said, rugby will be unbelievably boring if everybody plays the same tactics. And we might not do the same tactic next week. Like they might not do the same tactics. Like they might not, like they might not do the same tactics. Okay. So he's obviously alluding to the fact that people calling them boring, trying to twist the people's criticism by saying that everyone plays in the UK. So the only team that plays the same strategy is you. The box kicking strategy is you, mate. The only team that's been playing this strategy since 2019 is you. In fact, in 2019, your team didn't even play the box kicking strategy, relied on it, to this extent, you went from doing about 30 kicks per game to 40 kicks per game. You have overwhelmingly relied on the box kick in, in, in this year than ever before. So the only team that is unbelievably boring for doing the same tactics is you. I know that's not what you said, but this is basically what you're doing. Okay. And the All Blacks play your strategy, play your game plan, and outplayed you. The Wallabies played a different strategy, different playing game, game plan, and outplayed you. So, you are the only one playing the same strategy. So, uh, 
Yeah, and and like not only the same strategy, you're the you're the team that plays only one strategy. Unlike the All Blacks, or to some extent the Wallabies, they have different strategies in one game. You have no other strategies but one. Okay? So not only that you're playing the same tactics, it's not playing the same tactics. This won't even be an S. You're playing the same tactic every game. So something needs to be done to be changed. And uh, that might be in the form that's coming up next week in the huge, huge return of Chesel and Kobe. So I had a discussion with some of you guys in the comments that maybe the reason that the over overwhelming kicking has worked for Springboks and made them look really, really good in the past is because of Chesel and Kobe. Because Chesel and Kobe is an absolute god under the high ball, getting the return kicks, like being able to just literally score tries from poor return kicks from anywhere on the field made him such a threat. I made the kicking strategy look a lot better towards the Springboks' favor. And without him on the field, the, string, the, the kicking just looked like wasteful. But when he was on the field, it just looks like such a threat. Like he's literally creating a space for him to work with, to run the ball back, or to challenge the high ball. He's just that damn good, that much of an athletic freak. He makes your stupid strategy look good. So maybe there could be a glimmer of light this weekend. If they decide to stick to the same strategy, that's Chesel and Kobe could potentially bring the team out of the drought. Because it really is. If you watch the Springboks versus Lions games, Chesel and Kobe was everywhere. Like, literally, the, the entire, everything, like, you wouldn't even believe this. He's, like, the shortest person on the field, and he's the one get chasing the high balls. And just an unbelievably athletic freak to be able to do that. So on the bad news, Marco van Staden got hurt towards the end of the match. You can tell he did a few really, really good runs against the All Blacks, trying to bring the sprint box back in, in, in position for a drop goal or for a, for a penalty. And he kind of like hurt himself, it looks like. Uh, so that was, yeah. So maybe that will make a difference for the sprint box team. Uh, and the, the second game of the weekend, rugby, uh, rugby championship, Australia versus Argentina. This one was a very clinical performance by, by the, not clinical, very dominant performance by the Wallabies over the Argentina. Quite, quite a, yeah, big margin here in terms of territory and attacking meters. 600 meters, over 600 meters for the Wallabies and just over 200 for the, for the Argentinians. And, but the score, uh, scoreline didn't actually do it justice. The Wallabies actually squandered a lot of, opportunities this game with their own handling errors and drop balls good argentinian defense did play into that a little bit some of the criticism not criticism some of the blame went to wet conditions not wet conditions um sweaty conditions in humidity so the board was said to be a little bit slippery the all blacks with spring box had the same issue as well there was a lot of drop balls from the all blacks team so the rhythm a lot of the rhythm the smooth smooth attack patterns that the all blacks had through, uh, th throughout the rugby championship was not seen in that game very much. So could be actually be a legitimate issue for both teams. So the Wallabies probably could have been a bit further ahead, just missed out the bonus point. And, but overall, this was quite a dominant performance over the Argentinians. Three tries to the Wallabies and one to Argentina. And this was, this spelled the third straight win for the Wallabies and the first time since 2017. And this was the first time since 2015 when the Wallabies won three in a row in the rugby championship. So really, really monumental occasions. Samuel Karevi has been touted as the best center in the world. Still quite got quite a bit to go, mate. But he's definitely got the potential to be the best center in the world. And just the amount of line breaks has been quite impressive from Samuel Karevi. He's just quite the menace on the field these days. So very proud to see him. And Dave Rennie reflected on the game saying that there's plenty to improve. They're, they're a bit grumpy about the handling errors. I think that is a good attitude going in for the Wallabies. Never get too complacent. Never get too comfortable with just a couple wins over the the Springboks. Uh, there's just, there's always room to improve. And there's always room to improve for every player in the, in the game. And yeah, I'm good to see that Dave Rennie has that attitude. And... It's good to see. So also there has been some talks for the Wallaby Spring Tour that they could potentially bring back in 
curly beal. So I'm a little bit excited. And again, I thought hopefully he doesn't just get handed a jersey because he's a big name. So Dave Rooney has clarified that they don't give out test caps away except for a lot of CEO. Uh, so a lot of CEO aside, uh, Dave Rooney does not give out test caps away. So this was also to do with this was also to do with the game against the Argentinians that people thought maybe this would be a good time to run some debutants. But Dave Rooney really wanted to not just put on a dominant performance, but Dave Rooney recognizes that there is a lot of small intricate part, uh, small intricate cogs needs to work out for the World Cup so that he's not just going to waste an opportunity to throw a bunch of debutants on the field and while still trying to iron out some of the little you know, little aspects of the team that he still tries to improve on. And there was also a pretty big blunder by Sander last week. So I saw this actually and I immediately I thought, uh-oh, somebody screwed up here. So there was a photo opportunity for all the captains. Oh, this, you can't actually read this article. But anyway, so there was a... Not giving you my personal... So anyway, uh, so there was a photo opportunity between the three teams, Australia, Springboks, and New Zealand. And Argentina was missing from the photo op with the tri uh, with the champ- rugby championship trophy, like on on some like some beach or somewhere. But yeah, I thought that was pretty bad. I, when I saw that, immediately I was like, "Where's Argentina? <laughs> where is uh, where is uh, where is um, uh, Monta- Montea?" And sure enough, uh, there was pretty big backlash by Medes- Medesma for not inviting Argentina. Like, it's pretty big. Like oversight to not invite one of the four teams in your rugby championship to have a photo opportunity with a trophy. Like that is pretty poor. Like pretty poor management. Some people probably should get removed for doing such a stupid job. Um, and anyway, and also last week we saw the World Rugby. <laughs> Some of the stupidest guidelines I have ever seen in, the, in, the, in my life. So what does World Rugby do? Like, like, what do they even do? Like, do these people literally get paid for doing, like, for coming, like, do they really have nothing better to do in their roles and coming up with this stupidity? So World Rugby has issued a contact guideline to reduce injuries during training. So a maximum of 15 minutes full contact training per week. 15 minutes per week. You should be doing like 30 minutes per day. What? 15 minutes per week. Uh, and it's across two days. So seven and a half minutes of full contact a day, maximum. Uh, it's just like, why, who did these studies? Like, who did these studies? Maybe the reason players are getting injured in training because they're not in shape. <laughs> or like, maybe to do with yeah, I, maybe to do with the specific activity they're actually doing. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Oh, that's just so dumb. So uh, anyway, so they have also limited. A live set piece training to more, no more than 30 minutes a week. So what's the difference between live set piece training than foot? Full contact training. Isn't live set piece training the same as full contact? Like, if you, the, the whole point of live set piece training is the full contact, right? So you're contradicting yourself. Like, what are you, like, what's going, like, so Dave Rooney basically, like, reflected, I don't think anyone can follow these kind of rules. It's just so rich, stupid. And, uh, so they, the reason they cited this is that there's 40% injuries happens at training. Yeah, because there's, because you're literally playing two hours Think about this, right? You're spending all week, seven, six days out of the seven, let's, let's say five days out of the seven, because assume you have a day off, training, and you have two hours of playing the actual game on the weekend. Of course, 40% of the injury is going to happen in training because the majority of your life is training. Like I could be I walk, I go to the gym, I don't even do contact, and I hurt myself sometimes. Just the fact that I'm doing physical activities could lead to injuries, and it's just, uh, it's so stupid. So the thing they don't tell you is, the 40% injuries, how many of the 40% is actually from contact? 
People could just like, you know, slip and roll the ankle. They could be like, or like, like I said, I, I hurt myself in the gym. I don't hit anybody. I do bench and I hurt my, my, uh, my, my triceps sometimes from overtraining. So I could put, I, I've done that more than actual getting like, you know, like I've done that a lot actually overtraining myself and getting hurt from, from not getting the right recovery. So which part of the 40% is actually a result of contact training? They don't tell you, but yeah. So it's just so baffling. Like, what are you doing? Like, to be honest, the one thing I know for a fact is if you don't do contact training, you're going to end up with more high tackles because players haven't been training. Uh, you, and then you're going to end up with more injuries in the game, like much severe injuries in the game as well because your bodies are not tuned to contact and suddenly you're getting hit very hard in the game. You actually going to, and your body is not trying to like, I guess, mitigate the impact to like, to like, you know, get to not, not used to getting hit by the impact to not like manage yourself to avoid getting injured. You're actually going to get injured more in the game and in a way badly. And you know what's going to happen when that happens? It's going to be broadcast live on TV across the world that everybody's going to see some poor bloke gets stretched off the field with a broken neck or something because they have done, they've done 15 minutes of full, uh, full contact training. It's just unbelievable. Like, what, who paid it? Like, seriously, who paid for this stupid thing? When they say 40% of injuries happen in training, they don't tell you which part of the 40% is actually from full contact. Like, absolute stupidity. I, I just... Anyway, let's move on to some uh, some other news. Like, sometimes I see these things from World Rugby. I just question, who pays them to do this? Where did the money go? Where did the money go? Pay me the money, and I could do a better research than this. It's just, uh, where did the money go? You just gave it to your friends. Gave it to your friends that... Anyway, Eddie Jones, some big news from, uh, from England. Eddie Jones confirms that he'll exit England rugby after 2023 World Cup. And he has selected a squad for a little training camp on the weekend and potentially the team for the spring tour. So Eddie Jones has pretty much drawn a line in the, in the, in the sand. And the big news came out of the training camp selection is that he seems to be... He seems to be shuffling taking some of the criticism from the media to shuffle up some of the selections and he's dropped four really really big names on the team so he's dropped um he's dropped do i have an article here he's dropped um yeah so he has dropped george ford the big number 10 so coming in potentially marcus smith at 10 position potentially for england coming in so a very young prominent prominent player Billy and McIlvin Apollo got dropped. So yeah, like I thought that's probably not the issue why people were criticizing you for. Jamie George also got dropped uh, a hooker. So I, again, I don't see how, why that's an issue. Well, Elliot Daly wasn't selected due to injuries, but yeah. Uh, so the biggest news that came out of the selections is that Michael Liner's son, Um, Lewis Lana, is this it? yeah, so, uh, Lewis Lana, so, he is actually selected for the squad, he plays wing, so potentially, he could get a debut for England, and then, you know, there had been a lot of talks for him to play for Wallabies, he's, apparently he's expressed interest to play for the Wallabies, but once he debuts for England, he's not able to play for the Wallabies, un unless he takes four years away from playing for England. So he has to take some time off from playing for England, like four years or something, maybe more, to be able to switch to play for another nation. But I think playing England is probably the better option for him as he's grown up in England, he's played premierships in England, and it's just greener pastures. In England, get more money, mate, more money. So I, I, don't, I wouldn't be surprised that he uh, wanted to play for England. There's no reason for you to put your financial well-being for some weird pride that the fact that your dad used to play for the Wallabies. His dad was one of the, you know, great Wallabies 
fly half in the 1980s and uh so so there has been so with the resonation of not resonation of the upcoming end to eddie jones's run at england there has been a lot of questions as to who's going to replace him so one of the men that was leading talked about the most is warren gallon i thought warren gallon wanted to retire or something didn't he why isn't he coaching why i mean sure warren gallon the long-time coach for the wales the most successful Lions coach in history, and he's potentially looking at the England's job. So interesting to see how that goes. The the former Welsh head coach take he he did a really great job for Wales, taking Wales from basically a like second tier team that was struggling to win games left and right to like a tier one nation that was almost you know toppled the South Africa in the semi finals. To you know, who won the World Cup eventually, the South African Springboks. So he's done a very good job for for Wales, and he also done a really good job for for Lions as well. And Sir Ian McGeehan said that he was thinking he Gallon would be the first selection in the in the shortlist or one of the men in the shortlist. But despite the fact that uh, Ian McGeehan was criticizing him in the Lions still for playing boring rugby and that's why you lost. So immediately he's putting him him in as uh, the coach, head coach, potential head coach. So Warren Gallon also, he's currently supposedly the head coach for Chiefs and he had a, a sabbatical last year to coach the Lions. But now they actually, the Chief, now he's back for the Chiefs instead of coaching. He's now being put in as the director of rugby so the same role as rassi erasmus at the spring box so maybe we can see gatlin running water for the chiefs maybe we shall see that's the role of director of rugby as far as i know is running water on for your team right so we shall see if he does that so the united rugby championship is a 16 side championship this is basically the rainbow cup last year which included some of the south african teams and a lot of the European clubs. So I won't go into the exact details, but basically this includes uh, 16 teams from five rugby nations, including South Africa. And this is has, um, yeah, so this is basically the rebranding, the Pro 14. They already re rebranded to Bramble Cup last year. So this is now, it's now expanded to 16 teams. And this will be basically the premier rugby tournament in Europe. Uh, in the next Nick coming up this later ne next year coming up next year and also the Wallabies looking at uh, again this is not showing but the Wallabies also looking at two months off for the spring tour I don't know why I had this this article was showing for me but I don't know why it's just it was I was literally reading it just before and it's just blocked but anyway so the Wallabies looking at a pretty long tour aboard uh, same as Springboks and New Zealand so a lot of the players are going to be away for two months without being able to see, without being able to see their families. And uh, apparently the, the game with Springboks going to Edinburgh against against the Sco uh, Scotland, apparently it's already been sold out. So some good, good, good rugby ahead for everybody to watch. And uh, yeah, that's the news for the week. Thank you for watching this video, guys. Enjoy your coffees. Enjoy your day. <sighs> I, uh, I might have to go take a nap. Thank you for watching, guys. And uh, see you guys later this week for team announcements. Cheers.